Hello and welcome to the DRF webinar on playing the Los Alamitos thoroughbred meat. I'm Mike Hogan, Director of Product Marketing, and it's my pleasure to be joined by the DRF Southern Correspondent, Steve Anderson. Welcome, Steve. Hey, good morning. Thank you. Glad to have you on here. I know we um, we had a long Santa Anita meet, uh, a very exciting Santa Anita meet with a lot of um, interesting racing. Now we get a little bit of a break in the calendar before going back to Santa Anita again, um, and we switch over to the Los Alamitos. They call it the Los Alamitos Race Course, which is, I guess, to um, differentiate it between the night meeting that would still be going on at Los Al. Uh, and, and the track configuration is a little different from that night meeting, and obviously it's a little different from um, what players are used to from Santa Anita. So why don't you talk a little bit about uh, this particular Los Al meet and what makes uh, racing here different from, say, some of the other meets in Southern California? Well, this is actually uh, the third year that Los Alamitos has had daytime thoroughbred racing following the closure of Hollywood Park in 2013. In 2014 and 15, the track held meetings in July, September, and December. Well, this year, their three meetings are going to be April, September, and December. So this is a different calendar uh, for them this year, and therefore there are some different uh, uh, circumstances for the meeting that starts on Thursday today. For example, uh, you know, they usually are before or after a very popular Del Mar summer meeting, or secondly, they're right before the, the start of the uh, popular Santa Anita meeting. Well, uh, in the winter time, well, this time that you know they're coming off of a long, a long Santa Anita meeting, which ran a lot of races, a lot of races at the end of the season. And secondly, they're they're uh, they're not near Del Mar, so it'll be interesting to see how they do in terms of attracting fields. They did fairly well Thursday and Friday, but not so well on Saturday. Saturday's card came up a little shorter in terms of number of runners. Although there are two interesting stakes races that uh, are worth diving into. So in that sense, it's a it's a different time of year. They only race on dirt. There's no turf racing there. Uh, and it has a longer stretch at 1,380 feet than anything in the United States. In fact, they turn for home, jump a few strides, and then they hit the quarter pole. So it's really a long stretch uh, compared to the 3 sixteenths of a mile stretch that we have at most United States tracks. So in that sense, a little different uh, layout to the race course. Big sweeping uh, last turn, a um, bit of a tight first turn to, uh, to accommodate that long stretch, and a, a bit of a jog out to the right, a little elbow on the back stretch at about the five furlong pole, four, four and a half furlong pole, uh, which is a little different than what we're used to. You know, no, so many American racetracks, you know, with the exception of maybe Belmont Park, are so uniform that it's almost like they just took a big cookie cutter and just stamped it on the earth. Well, this, mm -hmm. one's, this one's a lot, a little different in that regard. So it does present a few different uh, questions from people who, who, who bet races. You have to sort of, uh, uh, you know, be aware of that long stretch. And remarkably, it's not a closer's track per se. It's very friendly to horses that are on or near the lead. So in that sense, uh, you want to be pretty close. Like Brad Fried did some research for Thursday's edition of the Racing Forum. In an article posted on the website earlier this week, wrote that uh, you know it's really the sort of course where you want to be really close when you go a mile. And even on, even on one-turn races, you want to be within a couple of lengths turning for home. You don't want to leave yourself with too much to do. There have been exceptions to that. There have been some spectacular exceptions to that. But quite, quite honestly, it has a little bit of a conveyor belt feel. So yeah, that, so that's an interesting point, and it's it's some of what I've seen a little bit in when I when I followed the meet. Do you, with that in mind, tend to upgrade uh, certain horses, not necessarily that are able to win from off the pace, but what I've seen is sometimes it's difficult for horses. You know, sometimes you'll see a bunch, the leading group, and then two or three lengths to the mid group, and then two or three lengths to the the the, the closers. Um, I've sometimes seen ones that are able to move up, even if they don't win, from one group to the next, are often running much better than than what it looks. Have you found that to be the case as well? Yeah, you do see that a little bit. You see horses that can, you know, wind up only second or third in the race, but actually do run very well, and then come back next start, no matter where that may be. Uh, and, and perform against that. Uh, you know, you have to you factor in many other issues as well. Uh, that you know, we're only going to see these horses at this race meeting uh, probably once, maybe two times. It's only a three-week race meeting that goes until sat Sunday, May first, Thursday through Sunday basis. So, you know, we won't see too many runners twice. But there all right. there probably will be some first-week runners that come back in week three. So you might see some chances to capitalize on first-hand accounts as well. 
Right, or if nothing else, take that information to the the Santa Anita meet, or even later in the in the summer at, at Del Mar. Um, all right, well, we're going to cover a number of other things. I've got some of the questions that I that I want to uh, address up on the screen, but I think what we'll do is. We'll, um, we'll dive into the races and we'll cover them as we go, but I want to remind people that this is meant to be a very interactive webinar. You're able to ask questions at any point throughout the discussion. Uh, they'll get passed on to me and uh, I'll either dive in as we're talking or we'll wait until the end uh, and cover some general ones um, if we have time. Uh, otherwise, you can also reach out to myself and to Steve on Twitter. I'm at DRF form Formulator. Um, as many of you know, and Steve is at DRF Anderson, uh, that's Anderson E-N, um, when we're both happy to answer any questions if we may, aren't able to cover them in today's webinar. Uh, all right, I'm going to jump over to Formulator now, and let's look, look at some actual race cards. So this is the Los Al race course one, not to be confused with the night meeting Los Alamitos uh, one. If you want to pull the double headers, and, and Steve, I'm wondering, are you going to be pulling any double headers this uh uh, this current yes, meet. in fact, I've got um, some stakes for quarter horses. There's one on the 17th, and then there's the big night. If I'm let me get this straight, yeah, the final night, May 1st, kindergarten for 32 year olds, 300 yards, probably about 10 divisions, top 10 times go to the final. Two weeks later, 325,000. So, uh, nice. if you need to find me on uh, Sunday, May 1st. I should be, still be over there late. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. You know, if you have the time and you can make it out to the actual races. Um, why not stick around for the night meet uh, when they're both running? Uh, all right, let's take a look at uh, today's card. It's the opening day card, Thursday, April 14th. Uh, I wanted to look at um, the third race first because we've got a couple of interesting horses, and we talked a little bit about how Los Alamitos does not have a turf course. Um, well, that made me wonder about number five, Silver Mojave, who's run 20 times in her career. Um, nine of those times were on turf, eight of those times were on synthetic, uh, hasn't run on the dirt since August of last year at Del Mar where she ran seventh. So her best efforts have not come on the dirt. However, she's five to two in this field and if her turf form carries over to the dirt surface, she's certainly a player. What do you do in your handicapping with horses like this who are essentially turfers or synthetic runners but are now running on the dirt because that's all they have available in Southern California? And there's a couple of factors here. This is Mike Pipey is the trainer of Silver Mojave, and he's doing something very similar on Saturday in the Bertrando Stakes. So this is something he's willing to experiment with through the weekend. And I think uh, definitely when you look back on this horse's uh, form, even farther into 2014, there are a couple of races in the Northern California Fairs for races at this level that leave this fairly competitive in this race. Two second place finishes at Santa Rosa and the Oak Tree at Pleasanton meeting. So in, in that regard, the fact that these horses train on 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 uh, on the main track so often, and particularly this field, he actually had a workout on it a few weeks ago, uh, is, is probably a positive sign. Another thing is, is that the class level difference between uh, her third place finish last time out down the hill in a $32,000 claimer, now into this starter allowance, I think is a positive for her. One of the negatives, unfortunately, is the filly drawn to her inside is Wish I Understood, trained by Bob Baffert, who, who won a $40,000 claimer for Maidens last August at Del Mar by 12 and a half lengths at 2 to 5. It hasn't been seen since, but she trains at Los Al, typical of a Baffert horse, and typical of horses at Los Al in general. She's got some pretty quick works over the last two months. So if Wish I Understood fumbles in any capacity, if she's not ready to race or if she's not as good as they think she is at this level, then Silver Mojave is one to, is one to follow. Don't be discouraged by the, the turf to dirt angle. Um, in, in, in that sense, uh, she, you know, she has one on synthetic, so she's shown, shown some versatility in terms of racing services. Uh, even though she is only one for 20. But hey, if you're a trifecta better, you're already a marker. She's gone second and third 12 times. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's interesting you mentioned Wish I Understood, as you mentioned, coming off the long layoff off of that, uh, boy, uh, eye-catching win in her last start at Del Mar uh, against Maiden 40 competition. I wanted to see him. Of course, she beat the field by 12, almost 13 lengths. Um, so it's, it makes sense, and she only got a 59 buyer, which uh, at least on the face of it doesn't seem competitive with one like Silver Mojave or even uh, the runner of the outside, um, 
Tis Sweet Bliss, who I think is a little interesting in here and is one of my favorite angles in the starter allowances, which is a horse who broke their maiden for the maiden special weight but qualified because was in for the tag in a previous start. Um, I think she's another one that's coming off of a long layoff as well, so if she's not ready to fire, um, maybe it does open the door for one like Silver Mojave, but I wanted to see the quality of field that Wish I Understood beat. <laughs> Looking at the, that field, she beat five runners that day. None of them even hit the board. None of them even hit the super high five in their next start. The top <laughs> buyer was a 15. Um, and I won't click through every one of them, but only, I'll tell you this, <clears throat> Run Brioni Run, Danny's Girl, Miss Amador, Gusto's Gal, they're all still maidens. The only one to win a race was Richie's gal, or Rich Gal, um, who did so on the turf at Turf Paradise uh, and then hasn't won since, even though she tried a couple stakes races. It's not exactly the saltiest field that I uh, wish I understood crushed. So uh, at a short price, um, I, was, uh, I was wondering if, if, if she was one you might take a stand against. Yes, I would. And then Silver Mojave is the alternative. Too Sweet Bliss, trained by Marty Jones. His runners tend to need a start when they come off layoffs. I'd be more, right. more have more appeal with Silver Mojave over Too Sweet Bliss in an effort to try to beat Wish I Understood. Right. All right. Let's. Um, we talked about those two stakes races on Saturday. Let's jump over to the Saturday card and dive into to those uh, because they do allow us to talk about some of the other questions that I wanted to cover in this webinar. What kind of connections, trainers, owners, even jockeys, um, we get we get jockeys from different circuits here. Sometimes you see ones coming from the Los Al night meet. Um, some of the, the main jockeys that you might know at uh, the Santa Anita meet or the Del, Del Mar meet aren't necessarily riding at the, the Los Al day meet. Uh, do you put different weight on either the jockeys or the trainers in this meet than you would at the uh, Santa Anita meet, for instance? Not so much with the trainers because, you know, they still have to operate a stable 12 months out of the year. And, and in the same context, the jockeys, you know, often ride, need to be competitive no matter where they are. But you, because of this position on the April calendar this year, there have been some changes along those lines. I expect to see trainers such as Phil D'Amato, Bob Baffers, Doug O'Neill, and uh, and and Peter Miller active at this meeting simply because they've got so many runners and they've got horses that fit every category per se that they need to race. They can't necessarily just sit back and wait for the resumption of racing at Santa Anita in early May and think, well, I'll just save that horse because there's going to be somebody waiting for you. Mm -hmm. And and right. they're going to have a runner for that race whether you like it or not. And you see this idiot's point of view uh, year in and year out, in, in and before Del Mar and in and before major meets at Santa Anita, with owners who insist that they run their horses at, at a high-profile meeting. I must, I've must i never been to a party when, when, you, when, you, when an owner and his friends watch their horse run eighth of 12, and I always wonder what the reaction was when they do that. So you'll okay. see some people who take advantage of that in the next three weeks at Santa Anita, I'm sorry, at Los Alamitos, because there is an opportunity in front of them to win a race, and you see sure. people maybe take chances as well. And when you look at, say, the fifth race on Saturday, which is the grade three Los Angeles stakes, a race that has been revived, by the way. It had been run at Hollywood for years and at Santa Anita in the last two years, but it um, it was on the chopping block uh, for 2016, and when they formed this Los Al April meeting, they said, you know, that would fit into our calendar, so it, it, it does do well here. But you look at a horse called, like, Sir Kip, will be ridden by Christian Aragon for trainer Juan Alamon, and people say, who on earth is Juan Alamon? He hasn't had a starter this year. No, he hasn't had a starter in the thoroughbred world, but in the quarter right. horse world, he trains champions. Right. And therefore, <laughs> you, know, you look at his horse and say, okay, fine, he's, he's got dreadful buyer speed figures. He was he was poor last year at Los Alamitos in a, in a state bred race. And, uh, but yeah, you look at his 870 form at, uh, at Los Al in his last three races, and he's won two of them against uh, quarter horses. And like you mentioned at the outset, this is a different layout. The, the low cell has a 5 eighths mile track they use for the night races. This is the mile oval, so this horse is going to do something he no really doesn't do. Uh, and he did win at Del Mar. Let's put that in, in context of two years ago this horse did win. His role in this race is very simple. He's going to be part of the speed with W. Giles. Mm -hmm. Those two yep. guys are flying down the back stretch and, and into the turn. And if either of them is in the first two at the wire, I'll be shocked. But they're <laughs> going to play an integral role in the race because they're going to wind up setting up a very quick pace for runners such as Yayanis, who is uh, in his second start off a layoff, 
Wild Dude, who was in the Breeders' Cup Sprint last October, and uh, and and was third in the Los, An Los Angeles Stakes last May at Santa Anita. Or horses such as Raised to Secret and San Onofre, who draw on the outside, both have legitimate little legitimate uh, chances to win this race too. So uh, you do mention. Um... I'm going to go back to something you mentioned about uh, some of the trainers that you would expect to be prominent at this meet. I, I, you mentioned Phil D'Amato, who, of course, won his first Santa Anita meet um, title, uh, you know, just on Sunday, uh, and did it in in authoritative fashion with uh, a runner we talked about on the DRF podcast yesterday in, in Enola Gray. Um, but he, I heard recently, and, and, and it may have been your article, about him sending a string of some of his horses down to Kentucky. He's, he's going to go nationwide after being based uh, primarily in Southern California. If you were seeing one of his turf runners show up at Los Alamitos versus, say, being sent to um, Keeneland, for instance, would you see that as a negative, or would you see that as uh, the same sort of situation where, well, he just needs to to race, and this is one he wants to keep in Southern California, so this is just where the horse lands uh, before the turf racing opens again in the in the spring, late spring and summer. I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, you have to look at what, what kind of race is this horse running in, and secondly, what's the horse's history in regards to turf races, uh, or uh, dirt races, and there may be other intangibles, such as an owner does wants to keep the horse in California, because that's where the owner lives. I mean, there's so many variables, and, the horse, sure. and then you get, you get into issues like, you know, Perhaps the horse isn't a very good shipper. You know, maybe that right. horse is, you know, those issues. Phil has a stable at Los Alamitos. He had his primary stables at Santa Anita, but he's got quite a few stalls at, at Los Alamitos. And it might be a case where the horse trains well over the track, even though it is a grass horse, and they may just want to try that service. So there's there's very many issues involved that go into the decision making. No, that's great. That's great. Um, I, I, it's, it's the sort of thing that I always question myself because I, as a handicapper, like to try and think like the connections. Uh, why is this horse here versus somewhere else? And um, sometimes that's a negative. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's uh, I'm overthinking things. And uh, it sounds like in in some of these cases that might be exactly what's going on. Uh, all right, let's let's jump to the next race, uh, the next stakes race on Saturday. That is, and you mentioned it a little bit earlier, that it's the seventh race, it's the one-mile Bertrando for Calbreds or Cal-sired horses. Um, and uh, similar to the angle we talked about uh, with uh, Silver Mojave, you've got a few horses in this race who are primarily turf runners, but running here on the main track at Los Alamitos going a mile. Um, do you upgrade or downgrade any of them based on their previous dirt form or lack thereof, or um, how are you approaching this race from a handicapping standpoint? I think it's kind of a little bit of a puzzle because you've got Poshke coming into the race off of a seven-day break. Uh, he was third, fourth in the, in the grade three Thunder Road behind What of You back on April 9th, just last Saturday, and I spoke to Peter Miller this morning. He says the horse is just bouncing around. It's, it's worth a try to come right back, and this race is a lot easier than that race was, and so for 100000 sure. He's going to try that. You got issues such as Never a Doubt, a first-time gelding who was a, a stakes winner at 41 to one on turf last year at Santa Anita, but did win um, on the dirt on a wet on a wet track last July at, at Del Mar, and then was a disappointing sixth in the stakes race, and hasn't been seen since. Now he's a gelding. He's come back to work well. I ex expect to see him do well, even though he's got turf form. You know, Boozer is is never. He's only run one once on dirt. And he was off the board. That was at uh, San Anita back in January. But his form in, in recent starts on turf is so good that, you know, I don't think Mark Glatt's going in there without uh, without some level of confidence. It's interesting. Gary Stevens rode that horse consistently um, through the season, but Edwin Maldonado takes them out. You know, Stevens is one of the jockeys that is not participating at this meeting. Uh, Stevens is uh, probably going to be at Keeneland for some major races. Uh, Mike Smith, Drayden Van Dyke, Flavian Pratt. Joe Talamo is traveling this Saturday. Uh, Santiago Gonzalez is sidelined with uh, a jaw injury. And Rafael Bejarano has a couple of suspensions. So in that sense, you, you're seeing a different different list of riders uh, than, than what you saw at Santa Anita in recent months. And you might see men like Tyler Bays and Edward Maldonado uh, and Mario Gutierrez take a more active role along with Fernando Perez, who... Uh, who was in a spill on the weekend, but but those guys have chances over the next three weeks to, to rack up a lot of winners, and I think one of them will be the leading rider of the meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's interesting. It seems like since it's such a short meet, um, some of these riders take it as a time to either go elsewhere, or take a little bit of a break, or um, really just, you know, like you said, serve some suspensions. And so, so in addition to some of these riders that uh, you might know at the Southern California meet, the Bases, the Maldonados, the uh, Perez, David Lopez, um, you'll also see a lot of the horse, the jockeys coming from the, the Los Al Knight meet. Uh, you know, Ramon Guse and um, some of the some of the others that you might not be as familiar with if you're just a follower of the Santa Anita uh, thoroughbred circuit. Um, some of those jockeys are very very good, and especially on a speed horse, they can be um, really dangerous in the, in this day, these day meets I've seen. Well, and then if you just notice in race six on on Saturday, the one before the 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 Bertrando Stakes, three of the riders are what we might describe as Los Al Knight riders. There's Vinny Bednar, there's Cassidy Clarice, who's a seven-pound apprentice, and there's Cheryl Charlton, who's who's a, underrated. I mean, she just doesn't mm -hmm. get the opportunities that she deserves. She's got 15 mm -hmm. winners already this year, and that's racing at Los Alamitos at night. She was one of the leading riders there at night and throughout the 2014 and 2015 meetings. She just doesn't get a lot of chances to ride up north, even though she's um, no, up north, and I say that by meaning Santa Anita. <laughs> 27 mile drive, but anyway, uh, but she doesn't get a lot of afternoon opportunities because she's in the barn area at Los Al all morning, and she often uh, focuses on stables that race at night. So it's you know it's a career choice. I mean, she could easily throw her energy behind a, a move to the day, and you wonder if would she succeed? Well, you know, it's hard to say. There's a lot of politics involved and a lot of luck needed. So it's uh, sure. At this meeting, though, you'd see her more often than you would see her at Santa Anita or Del Mar. Absolutely, and, and she, you know, she wins at such a high rate at the night meeting. Um, you don't want to just discount her because she's showing up on one of the horses in the day meeting. Um, okay, you can learn that the hard way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so let's go back to the Bertrando. So we talked a little bit about some of the horses coming out of uh, the different races, some class drops. You've got Ted West with uh, a turf horse. Who's, who's never hit the board on dirt, first off the claim, his uh, awesome return was uh, at one time, um, you know, a, a pretty decent and third to alert bay, um, ran close up to Boozer. This was, a, this was a good horse. Do you have any sort of strong opinions or s certain angles that you're going to be looking at when it comes to the Bertrando? Um, or are, is this is more of a this is too much of a puzzle, and I'm just going to see how things play out. I'm going to be interested to see what the tote board does, to be quite honest with you, because it's going to be a race where I think you could launch a bet um, going forward from, from you know, maybe a, a clue or two as to what the tote board's doing. You know, Avanti Bello runs back to his January 23rd optional claimer at Santa Anita, and he wins this from the inside post, but his last two starts, fourth and eighth, both against open company. Let's remember that. And by the way, he lost mm -hmm. to a guy named Melatonin in two races. Right. Back happen to win the San Diego handicap. So right. Avanti Bello, you know, has uh, full credentials to do well here, and he's got an opportunity, I think, to make maybe on the lead, which is beneficial in these mile races. Um, awesome return. You mentioned a four-time stakes winner, three-time stakes winner in 2014, including the quarter-million-dollar Snow Chief stakes. All those races were on grass, as you mentioned. His form has tailed off even before he was claimed for 62.5 by Ted West on March 3rd. Uh, they, they, they've given him a little bit of time. He's racing as a gelding for the first time, and he's trying to break a, a losing streak that, uh, you know, he's on to 11 races or 10 races right now. I expect a big race from Boozer, even though he is switching surfaces, and that's something that he hasn't uh, excelled on dirt, though, because I do think that his form is so good right now uh, in regards to the way he's been running in the, in the on the turf races at Santa Anita that he's hard to ignore. Mm -hmm. I'm encouraged by the quick turnaround for Poshki. I know I've given away a lot of horses here, but I, I'm encouraged by the quick turnaround for Poshki because it's a, it's a move you would have expected 50 years ago, and not not now, in the way that horses are managed. And and Miller, Miller said this morning, you can't do it unless you have a horse with the right constitution and soundness. You know, And after this, we're going to give him a month off. So he won't ready, race again until the end of May at Santa Anita, more than likely. So in that regard, you know, there are some runners in here. Soy Fett's run some big races in the past, but his form's tailed off. Um, since he won this race in 2014. So in that sense, you know, there's plenty of contenders, but I might look at Avanti Bello as my selection, owing to the fact that he uh, a good company and, and he does have a very attractive win on his record uh, this calendar year. 
Yeah, while you were talking, I looked up uh, Peter Miller in the last five years. He's, he's run 31 horses on a week's rest or less, and he won with six of them. So this is something he does every once in a while. He doesn't do it all the time, but he's certainly had enough success uh, in doing it. Um, I, I, I wouldn't discount Poshki, but I think you might be right with Avanti Bello, especially since uh, that race two back uh, has certainly been flattered by melatonin. The, the race last start, uh, you know, he's probably better going two turns than that seven furlong distance when he was really never a factor. Uh, from the inside post, he's probably going to be a little bit uh, more forwardly placed than he was in that one. Um, maybe he cuts the corner on the first turn and takes them uh, quite a ways. Um, but it's an interesting race, and uh, um, I think you're right. I, I, I'm curious to see what the public does with a lot of these turfers running on the Los Al uh, dirt. Uh, and, and maybe you do get a price on a horse like Avanti Bello. Be good. Be good. Be interesting. To be, like you say, it's an interesting race. It's a, it's a bit of a puzzle, and it's it's right smack dab at the end of, in the middle of the pick four too. So it's going to be a race on a lot of people's minds Saturday afternoon. All right. Well, I know you've looked at the cards for the last few days today, tomorrow, and Saturday. Uh, let's pick. Uh, and and I'll, uh, we haven't talked about this, so I'll, I'll let you go wherever you want. Is there is there a race in here that you find either really really interesting, um, and you could see a, a number of different winners, and it all comes down to what kind of price you get, or one you think uh, for the whole next three days? Uh, I've got one horse that I think is the most likely winner on any of those cards, and I'm excited to bet. Fill in the blank. Oh, right. Well, in that <laughs> sense, I, I might uh, kind of nominate uh, looking a little bit towards Minister's Adventure in the, uh, I'm sorry, Friday's seventh race. Friday's seventh? Friday's, okay. Friday's seventh race is an optional claimer for fillies and mares going five and a half furlongs. They're California breads. And the race drew um, a full field of 12. Now, there will only be uh, a maximum of 10 runners because uh, the, the course is a little, a little 11, 11 runners rather. The course is a little snug going into that turn, so it doesn't have a 12-horse field like some five-and-a-halves. Minister's Adventure, drawn the outside for trainer, drawn towards the outside for trainer Jerry Hollendorfer. This will be the shortest race of her career, but her her tactics uh, are beneficial for this this race, I think. She's got a nice style of being able to race near the front. She's going to be about, about two to one or so. I know that's not the, the biggest price in town, but uh, I do give her a big chance to, to, to win here. Uh, off of uh, what looks to be an advantageous trip, sitting behind a runner such as uh, Cindy Secret, who's shown a lot of speed, and even Miss Lujin, who's a, got some 870 form at Low Sal, and we know will be in front because she's got that kind of speed. And incidentally, that's a mount that Vinnie Bednar has. But Mario Gutierrez takes the mount on Minister's Adventure, who's two for seven. Actually finished the first three times, but was disqualified last summer at Del Mar in a one-mile turf race. She was a very good second in her comeback race on March 26th at Santa Anita just two weeks ago. Um, so in that sense, uh, I think she's got a chance to do very well here. She gets off the rail. She drew post two last time. Now she's on the outside. Another positive uh, factor. Minister's Adventure looks like one of the more likely winners on Friday's card. All right. I like it. Um, and uh, let's uh, let's last chance for everybody to, to ask any questions. Um, we haven't had any questions come in yet, um, but if you have any either about specific races or specific horses over the weekend, um, trainers, jockeys, how the track might play differently, uh, feel free to chime in. Um, we're going to otherwise um, cut it short. Let's, let's go back to today's card, uh, opening day. I'm sure you'll be out there in person. Um, who do you like? Do you have a best bet on today's card? Today's card, I, I would look at that Silver Mojave very strongly um, in, in the third race that we talked about at the outset of the program. I give that one a big chance. Um, that looks like a horse that, that should play a role in that in that race, uh, and a favorable one at that. Uh, looking through the rest of the program, uh, I, I'm, I'm intrigued a little bit by uh, what uh, Lord of Chaos can do uh, when it switches off the turf course and goes into six furlong dirt race for Calvreds in the fifth race, and that's trained by Brian Corner. Uh, it's been third, seventh, and fourth in three starts, um, and now goes back to its shortest race. But it's got speed, and I think that's going to be a big factor. Mm -hmm. Favorable buyer speed figures, too, mid-70s a couple times. Um, well, I would look at the tote board to see for support for number two, Anatolian Heat, see if that one can get, if that one, uh, trained by Peter Miller, gets some support. Uh, well, I would look at that. It's got uh, apprentice jockey Brayon Pena, uh, Pena aboard. 
uh, I'm more in tune with perhaps Tiago Pereira on Lord of Chaos for for uh, my selection in that race. But that's that's one that uh, that I would consider as well. One thing about Los Sal that you have to remember over the course of the, the next three weeks is this is an opportunity for a lot of people to run conditional claiming races. You know, you'll see horses that run in non-winners of uh, non-winners of two lifetime or non-winners of two in a certain time frame. You know, those races are becoming more prevalent at major tracks around the country. It used to be you had to go to Philadelphia Park or Turf Paradise or or uh, you know maybe a Delta Downs to find those those sort of those conditions being written. But like for example, the sixth race today it's at Los Al. It's an 8,000 claimer going five and a half furlongs for fillies and mares to never won two races. But there's a clause within that that changes the eligibility. Those horses, if they've won for claiming prices of 6,250 or less, they're not penalized on that non-winner of two. So mm. some of these runners have several wins. They just haven't right. been winning at the, the highest level, uh, or higher levels, I should say. So in that sense, you know, you see, hey, wait, this horse has won four races. Why is it eligible? Well, it's eligible because a few of those races were in modest companies. So in that sense, you know, you have to pay pay that pay that in mind a little bit when you, when you analyze the race. It comes down to runners such as number three, Secret Chords, who isn't uh, who has yet to win two races and was third in, in a similar race at this level at Santa Anita, April seventh, but well beaten. Or do you go with Clem Juice, number four, trained by Paul Geary, who is based at Los Al whose horse won an 8,000 claimer here back in December and was overmatched when a 47 to 1 ninth place finished down the hill at Sanity to March 17th. You know, that was a big, big, they took a shot, it didn't work. This, they're not taking a shot. This is a race for them to win. Really, it's a race for them to lose because they almost seem like a bit of a standout in the sense that this, this one can be well placed, uh, you know, early in the race and perhaps even on the lead or at least handy for Jockey Agu Polisi, and those guys work together very closely. So, you know, that's another example of you're almost doing a little bit of condition book handicapping as much as you're looking at uh, all the other elements that we incorporate into our selections. All right, well, we've had a few questions come in um, while we've been talking. Um, Troy Copeland wants to know about, uh, in race six, the one we were, we're looking at, do you think number nine has a chance, uh, has a bit, uh, a pretty strong closing time, um, at shorter and the Los Al night uh, races, and has won some of those sh uh, cheaper races, so is able to fit the condition in here. An eight-year-old mare who seems to be running from off the pace and gets a little bit more distance than she has uh, in her previous starts. Um, what, what do you what do you take about uh, I Troy's? See this more of a horse that would be second or third than winning. Uh, but it's actually a really good, a good example of reading the past performances at Los Alamitos and the difference between running at night and running during the day. If you'll notice that down Royal Royce's PPs, it's LA, LA, LA. Then you see one San Anita line. Then back in December, you see an LRC. Well, the LRC designates an afternoon race. So that just gives you an indication of, of what time of day, really, and how that horse was managed. Uh, you're right. It, had, it was third in, at this level last time in December. Uh, I should say. It has one going four and a half at night back in January. Uh, it, it really will probably benefit from an outside post in the sense that it, it'll it'll be you know in a, in a position to maybe make some ground up later. And yet Cassidy Clarice, who knows this mare very well, having ridden it uh, almost for like eight of its last night, seven of its last eight races or so. So in that sense, um, you know, a couple of positives, but overall, I think it'd be a surprising one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe the the best case scenario is is the one you hinted at from the December race coming out of these night races, third uh, at a huge huge price, probably paid quite well uh, to show, and certainly rounded out uh, probably a a very nice trifecta if you were able to get this one up for third. Um, but yeah, it's an, it's an interesting play, especially when you get so many horses moving up in class from different circuits, dropping down from an allowance race, for instance. Um, that's where you can get paid is if you can get a horse like this uh, to hit the board uh, and and key up the right verdict. Um, it's uh, I, I, those are the kinds of plays that that I find intriguing. All right, um, a couple other general questions that I wanted to cover before we wrap things up. Um, the post times for weekdays and weekends are they all the same? Does it change at all over the next three weeks? No, it's 2 p.m. Pacific. So it's actually interesting in the sense that they've done this on purpose, uh, of course, because if you think about it, there aren't that many races left at venues such as Aqueduct or or Keeneland or Gulfstream at that hour, and Oakland Park is well into their program, too. So when you get out of those major East Coast uh, 
programs. This is one of the, the remaining cards of the uh, of the evening time for the East Coast and the afternoon for West Coast. So in that sense, they hope that by, by starting a little bit later, they'll get some attention from people who are watching from around the country and not just on a regional basis. Uh, that, <clears throat> that does make a lot of sense. Um, and, and that was a question from Anthony White. He also wants to know, are there any guaranteed pools, uh, any guaranteed pick fours or pick sixes uh, for this current meet? I shall research that right quickly, and while we're talking about that, I will uh, offer an, uh, an answer. I believe there is, but I'm not certain of it, so give me just a moment. We'll, uh, we'll continue on, and then hopefully we'll have that data for you as well. No problem. While you're listening, or while you're researching, though, I will mention on um, April 23rd, there is a Los Alamitos live money contest. It's a $400 buy-in, of which 200 goes to... Uh, the prize pool and 200 goes into your becomes your bank for betting and competing. Um, it's a it's it, it's I think five NHC seats are being awarded. Of course, in addition to uh, the prize money that you can win, so the top five finishers will all get seats to the NHC. Um, that is as these live money contests go. Um, a, a relatively reasonable one from a buy-in standpoint, and might be a very fun day of racing on the 23rd. Um, Steve, you probably know that's a week from Saturday. Are there, There's some pretty uh, decent decent races scheduled for that that week, or for that day, rather, right? Yes, there are. In fact, that uh, April 23rd card is going to have the, the race of the meet, and the prize money is the $200,000 Great Lady M Stakes for Phillies and Merits, which is fantastic style, trained by Bob Baffert, will be the well, probably will be the favorite for that race, so it should draw a decent race. It's a grade two going six and a half. It's the most prestigious race in the meet in that regard, prize money and status, so I expect that'll be a good card. They expect quite a few players for that tournament uh, because uh, so many seats are available for the NHC that uh, they're hoping to draw a lot of folks who might you know, be stay-at-home bettors, or they may be guys who might not necessarily be in this region but might fly out for the weekend, so it's going to be an interesting uh, a contest to see how many players are sign up for it and who wins because I got a friend of mine who finished second in the December contest that they held and he qualified for NHC for the first time so it's, wow. it's always fun to watch that unfold as to how you manage your bankroll and how, what what successes you have and how you can try to develop your position in the standings as the afternoon wears on. To answer, to answer the question, I didn't see any guaranteed pools uh, being offered uh, however if uh, later this afternoon if I, if I become aware of anything uh, I will post that onto the Twitter feed and let everybody know if there are. Those are interesting gimmicks. Uh, at Santa Anita this year, they always posted a, a guaranteed pick four pool, and they never really were threatened with not mm -hmm. reaching that number. Mm -hmm. Conversely, they offered a $150,000 pick six guaranteed pool on weekends, and there were at least six instances when it didn't get there. Um, they had to make mm -hmm. up the difference. And I don't think without with just a good guess. I don't think they'll offer the guaranteed pick six pool when the main meeting opens there. But I think that and and they always hit the guaranteed pick four because it's such a popular bet. So in a sense it's kind of an interesting promotion, but it doesn't really hold a lot. The only time it's really worthwhile is is if you happen to be a deep pocketed pick six better and it comes up ten or fifteen thousand dollars short of the guaranteed figure, they've got to make up the difference because they've promised it and now you're betting right. into it positive pool because you're getting a, a reduced takeout essentially for a bet that you've already invested. Right, right. No, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, and we got one other question from Richard Young wanted to know about Fusaichi Samurai in race seven today. Um, he notes that it's uh, the eight to five morning line favorite for Bob Baffert. Um, he wants to know if you think this horse is, is vulnerable at all as that favorite. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, filters he's using, but he's noting that Baffert is 0 for 30 uh, with these conditions. Um, I don't know exactly how he's coming up with that, but at least on paper, um, with uh, three career starts and uh, a, a loss by a neck to uh, calculator who went on to almost win the Carter uh, last weekend, this is one that at least on paper seems to be a standout. Do you think that there are any um, knocks against Fusaichi Samurai as, as a, a short price favorite? Well, no, I, but his point of view is interesting. He talks about how Baffert doesn't necessarily win these first condition allowance races, and here's two uh, two instances in which the horse has been beaten. I mean, granted, you know, losing the calculator back on February 13th was no shame at all, but he was right. expected to win. He was expected to win versus Second Summer and led by a length at the eighth pole. And he didn't get the job done, 
So in that regard, you know, yeah, I do believe that the horse is vulnerable under, in his mindset. And I might look at a runner such as Howdy, who's won twice in his career and is, is kind of moving out of the Calbred division for the first time since November of 14 and is also capable of running a race and did, did run a very good race when second here to Toledo Eddy on December 13th last year. And Toledo Eddy came back to win uh, his next start is also. So, you know, yeah. look at that. Look at that race with a little bit of uh, of an open mind. I think you might find might find that one could be one to look at too. And and I would say, yeah, I, I understand how people could go strong on Fusaichi Samurai in their selections. But if you're looking for an alternative, I think the second choice is a very very good one and uh, would would nominate that. I, just to add another horse to the to the discussion, uh, I would probably give the the five time winner. It is Living Water, a little bit of a chance. Um, he's been running on turf, but he has some decent dirt races uh, earlier in his career, and he, he he ran a good third on the dirt back in January at Santa Anita behind Toledo Eddie and Howdy. So, you know, he's got a little bit more to do from off the pace, or farther off the pace in most of his races, but he's also capable of hitting the board or perhaps pulling a surprise. Right. Well, you made that case for Howdy, and and uh, it is Living Water or, uh, finished just a nose behind Howdy. You're going to get uh, at least on the morning line eight to one versus five to two for Howdy uh, coming out of that race where Toledo Eddie then later flattered that form. If we look at his PPs um, from that off the claim from uh, Craig Delossi, Robert Diodoro put him into a $50,000 claimer, and he wired a field, ran away from him with a 106 buyer speed figure, which I believe at the time was the highest buyer speed figure for the Santa Anita meet. Um, off of that effort, he was sold privately to David Jacobson, who just took him to Aqueduct and rattled off two straight wins with him. Um, Toledo Eddie is a good, good runner. Uh, has, it seems like one that's gotten good as a seven-year-old gelding. Um, and I and I think you might be right. If you can make a case for one of these two running close enough to a horse like that, uh, maybe Baffert is vulnerable at that short price. That's true. Yep. So let's let's consider Howdy as an alternative to Fusaichi. Fusa <laughs> All right. Well, um, that'll do it. We don't have any more questions. We've covered a lot of information today. There's a lot of interesting races in the next few days at Los Alamitos, in fact, in the next few weeks um, before we get back to Santa Anita and back to the turf racing. Um, so thank you, Steve. It's been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure talking to you, whether it's on one of these webinars or on the DRF Players podcast. Uh, this is Mike Hogan for DRF.com. Uh, I'll mention to everybody that this webinar will be archived and posted to DRF.com slash YouTube if you want to watch the replay or send it along to somebody that might have missed it. Uh, but thank you, Steve. Thank and, you. And uh, look forward to doing this again, and good luck uh, not just this weekend, but the whole meet. Thank you very much, and we'll look forward to our next conversation. All right. Thanks, and thanks, everyone.